Welcome to the Dear Professor series, where college students who take courses online speak their minds. I am your host and e-learning strategist, Dr. Kelly Alston, who is honored to have a conversation with today's guest as she sheds light on her experiences as an online student. I've been teaching online since 2004 and made the tough decision to obtain my PhD through an online program. So I've been both an online instructor and an online student. As a result, I know that some wonderful things are happening with online programs, as well as some not so wonderful things going on. The purpose of this series is to help professors and students experience a more fulfilling online learning environment by allowing students to reveal their needs and their pet peeves. I hope that this information will support professors in making the necessary changes or adjustments in the design and delivery of their online courses, which should ultimately enhance student success and satisfaction with distance education. So if you're interested in hearing what students have to say about their lived experiences online, please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that every Wednesday at 8 p.m., the latest episode will come straight to you. Also, feel free to comment about anything said and ask questions. If you're listening via a podcast platform, be sure to follow and rate the series so that your interests and opinion of the show are made known. Now, it is the beginning of a new semester, and I have one question for you. Have you ordered the Professor's Week in Review? It is a journal for weekly reflections on your higher ed experience. Listen, I know that the demands of academia coupled with the responsibilities while adulting may leave you feeling drained, static, even though you are going and going and going constantly, and even unfulfilled. Journaling is a powerful step towards changing that. It has been shown to improve your mood, lower your blood pressure, spark creativity, reduce stress, boost self-awareness, and even help you sleep better. I have been journaling for most of my adult life, and because I know how powerful it is, I created this journal in 2022 specifically for processing my experience in higher education, but I could not keep it to myself. I am thrilled to offer this journal to you, which is now available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and Vervante.com. So head over to bit.ly forward slash Dr. Kelly Austin to purchase your journal today. You may also access the links in the description box and the show notes. Today, I'm honored to be sharing this time and space with the one and only Miss Jessica Glass. Happy New Year, Jessica. Happy New Year, everyone. How is 2024 going so far? 24, 24 is starting off pretty good. I, I think it's going to be a good year. But do you have anything special planned this year or anything you're hoping for that you can share that's not too personal? Um, So this year, I'm really just trying to get back into a typical routine and not feeling like I'm in survival mode so much. So I'm hoping for a nice, calm year, um, a relaxing year, back to traveling and mending some relationships. Oh, that sounds good. Well, Jessica, tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I am 29 years old. Um, some of my hobbies are uh, modeling. Um, of course, my interests are kids. I went to um, school to be a teacher, and I've been working with children for nine years now. So I feel like that that's my life. I have a six-year-old daughter. So I, I'm, if I'm not doing modeling or literally just spending time with my friends that I don't get to see so often now, I am doing something with children, I feel like, or especially my own. Okay, so let's talk about, number one, this modeling. Tell us, how did you get into that? How long have you been doing it? Give us the deets on that. So I've been modeling for just about as long as I've been working with kids. I um, pretty much started around the age of 20, and as I stated before, I'm 29 now. Um, I got into it by literally watching America's Next Top Model with Tyra Banks when I was in middle school and high school. I took a big interest to that show. And I actually auditioned for that show um, many years ago. 
But um, I started researching like modeling agencies near me. Um, the opportunity is not so big in North Carolina, I've learned, but I've had found a lot of opportunities to freelance as a model and uh, venture off and do a bunch of different runway shows and uh, a couple photo shoots, some promotional modeling. And I've even taken it as far as uh, modeling in New York Fashion Week in Orlando Swim Week. So, oh, my goodness, New York Fashion Week. Yes. So are there any big brands that you model for that we might know or is it more like local? It was more local. It was the company called High Tech Motor that I was modeling for. But it was a really great experience. And especially being that when I went there to do that um, show during Fashion Week, I had never been to New York City before. So it was a great experience. Oh, I have two cousins that actually auditioned for America's Top Model, too. I think they did it at I think they did it at Central or in Durham somewhere, actually, North Carolina Central University. I think they had a site or something. I have to check with them on that. But I remember both of them. They said it took all day for them yes. and they didn't get on the show. Um, they said there were some things where they asked you questions like, would you be willing to be uh, messy? I'm just be nice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, so and reality. <laughs> yeah, they weren't willing to do that. So they just kind of were like, I don't want to like that. Did they ask you that? Kind of, did they ask you anything like that? Would you be willing to? Um, They do let you know that like some of it is scripted because, again, it's more reality TV. So you do see that if you really were interested in modeling, I will say that um, that's more so of acting in my from my point of view. Right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Now, tell us about your daughter. You said she's six years old. My daughter just turned six. Um, she is the little version of me. So <laughs> she's coming into her personality a lot more every single day. But um, I really love that uh, I have a little mini me. And being a teacher, I feel like helps me a lot with her because I literally work with children the same age as her. Um, so she's very, very intelligent. She's very sweet. Um, but she's very bold as well. <laughs> she will speak her mind about anything. So will she be modeling too? She actually has um, been in a fashion show before. And she actually has recently done her first like little real photo shoot with a company called Enchanted Fairy. So I'm hoping one day she might take an interest. I just don't want to, you know, push her to do something that she doesn't want to. I'm going to always let her follow her own dreams, but be supportive in any way I can to whatever she does. Oh, so you might be a momager. Is that what they call the mommy? Yes. <laughs> I have said that already that I am the momager if she does start modeling. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, Jessica, so let's talk about these online courses. What is your general experience with taking courses online? So my general experience with online courses, I feel like I had a pretty good experience. I mean, as with everything, it had its ups and downs. Um, so I was majoring in early childhood education and I graduated in 2022 from North Carolina Central University. And um, I took my online classes fully online. I was there for three years. Um, I expected to be there for two. So that was one of the things, the issues I did have. I felt like um, coming in as a transfer student because I went attended a community college before I actually started at my university online. And in community college, I was there for two years and was going face to face. So I got to see it from kind of both sides. The only difference I feel like is that the community college, of course, is smaller. So sometimes I do say that, like, I didn't really get to get that that campus feel, you know, um, as far as like going to the homecomings, all the celebrations, the games, things like that at the school. So I feel like I did miss out on that. However, I feel like the online courses were very convenient for my lifestyle at right now uh, because as we um know from me saying before I do have a child um actually when I graduated the first time from community college she was literally a week old when the last semester of college was starting for me um so at that time I didn't even know if I was going to be able to do it and finish but I did um and then went back and later on that year to North Carolina Central University and trying it differently by being online um, but like I said, I was online for three years, every single semester, never did any classes in person online. Okay. So I just think it's remarkable that you were in school, had a child, finished school, and then pursued, kept on pursuing your education. I think women are phenomenal, the things that we can do. Um, so kudos to you for that. 
So online programs are structured differently um, depending on the institution that you attend. And you said that yours was a semester type program. Yes. So you took classes for 16 weeks? Yes, correct. Did you ever take classes in summer school, like the shorter sessions? I did take summer classes. I believe it was my first year at Central. Okay. And so those were like four or five weeks, right? Yes, those were a lot shorter. I believe no more than six, definitely. But okay. Yeah. So let's just pretend that um, I have asked you to be a part of a focus group, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And it's for a newly developed online program. And the target audience of the program is non-traditional students, which are students that are generally 24 years or older. They may work full or part time and they may have children. They may also attend college part time and may have delayed college enrollment after high school. They didn't just jump into college, you know, at 18. Can you relate to any of these characteristics? I actually can relate to almost every single one. Um, so I actually was a delayed college student because after graduating from high school, at first I thought I was going to like go off to USCG, go off to Fayetteville State, go off mm -hmm. to Bennett even. I applied to all those places and thought about going there. And then it just didn't happen. Um, I didn't have as much family support as I would have liked. But um, I still knew that I wanted to to go to school. I still knew I wanted to do something. And, and that was another thing. And that's one of the things that I say to a lot of newer college students. I have a god sibling who's attending Shaw right now. And I know he's always frustrated about, you know, not really being able to find himself. And I try to tell him that you're going to change your mind. I feel like a lot of people that are around my age that went to school to say the same thing. I started off with trying to pursue nursing at first, but I knew I wanted to work with children. I, I always said I wanted to be a pediatric nurse, but then the prereqs for nursing and having to kind of train in like a nursing home and actually see what that's like and become a CNA first. I knew that, 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 that just wasn't where I fit in. That wasn't where I belong. So delaying school, I feel like it's not a bad thing because it gives you that opportunity to actually kind of figure out more so where you actually belong, where you fit in. And I feel like going later, um, I believe I started community college in 2016 and I graduated high school in 2012. So but doing that, I feel like I, I wasn't wasting my time anymore. I wasn't wasting my money on my education anymore. I was actually getting into something that I knew that I was going to to do something with later. And that's why I decided to even after community college, go ahead and continue because I wanted to go even further with my associates. I was a lead teacher in the child care center. I was a teacher assistant in uh, public school, but I knew I wanted to become an actual licensed teacher. Jessica, you made so many good points because I know my generation, uh, a lot of us, you know, felt pressure to just go straight to college. Like, there, you know, or you go to the, you know, the military. Um, and so I find that the younger generations are doing that, what they call gap year. Yes, that or they're wait, they're working a little bit before they go. And I think that's great because when you get to college and you're changing your major four or five hundred times. And in the meantime, you're using up financial aid usually um, because, mm -hmm. us, you know, our parents didn't have the money to, to you know, then to save to pay for our college education. So your your financial aid debt is getting larger and larger and larger as you drop classes, change, figure out. So mm -hmm. that's a plus two waiting those four years. So during those four years that you didn't go to college, what were you doing then? At that time, I was working. Um, so just at first, I was still working like my typical first job in a fast food restaurant. But then as I was in school, it was a good thing because as I got into um, community college, we, even though I wasn't finished, I was able to like with my certificates and things, even before I went to community college. Matter of fact, I took some parent child development classes during high school. So that kind of helped me to 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 kind of figure out, like I said, exactly where I wanted to be, because with me taking those classes during high school, I was actually able to go and be like a floater in a child care center. So I still I still got to start off and see what that career looked like from like I was at the bottom, but I got to see what it looked like from there and where I really wanted to be in it. So I felt like that was very helpful as well. Um, I love how high school gives you an opportunity to explore different careers with some of the classes you take during that time. Oh, that is wonderful. 
So now we're back to our moderator. I mean, to me being the moderator of this focus group. So I have to ask you a few questions and you will receive a gift card at the end of these, uh, our session. Is that okay? Okay. Make believe like my daughter used to say. <laughs> it's not me out. <laughs> what do you consider a feasible and most appealing length of time for your courses? In other words, do you like the semesters? Do you, would you prefer eight weeks, four or five weeks? That's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. I feel pretty old school now because I have to say, I, even though um, while I was in school, that was one of the things I kept saying is I'm ready to be done. I'm ready to be done. I'm ready to be done. <laughs> I still feel like to to get an effective um, education and actually really, truly learn, you still do need that full semester. Um, I just feel like it, it just goes along, even though it's online, it, it fits in with where everybody else is too, because um, I personally just feel like the online courses, they, they work better when they still feel like you are in the classroom as much as you can get it to feel like that. Okay. My personal opinion. Yes. Okay. Well, which mode of delivery would you prefer? Asynchronous, where there are no live sessions, synchronous, where there are regularly scheduled live sessions, or a virtual hybrid, and that's where you would have Scheduled synchronous sessions, maybe like every other week, every couple of weeks, spread throughout the course. You know, surprisingly, I think I've only had one hybrid class, and that's when I was in community college. I did do that, but everything else was face to face there. Well, at Central, I was all fully online, but surprisingly, I think I like the hybrid the best, even though I've only had one. And I say that because sometimes with the online courses, I've had professors who seem to just post the content, post the schedule, post the syllabus, tell you to read it all and turn it in by the time it's due. It felt like, you know, you were kind of self-teaching. You just are responsible for reading the material yourself and taking your test online or submitting your assignments when they're due and you'll get your grade and that's it. Um, I mean, I literally can't remember some of my professor's names in courses like that because it didn't feel personal. It didn't feel like we had any type of relationship. Now with the synchronous courses that I've taken, I felt like I got to know the professor. I got to know the other people in the classroom because I was forced to participate. And at first I did not like it because <laughs> I was used to, I, I'm, I'm being honest, I did like the uh, working at my own pace and self-teaching to a certain degree because of my busy lifestyle. But that's the only reason why. It wasn't, um, I do definitely feel like I learned more um, in the synchronous courses where I was forced to participate. I was forced to build relationships with my professor and with my classmate. Um, working at my own pace, as I said, the the biggest benefit of that and one of the only benefits really was just being able to still live my normal life of working and being a mom and not feeling like I'm busy as a bee 24-7. Right. Um, I think you made a good point there too sidebar focus group uh, when you talked about um, the convenience and I think a lot of programs this is my personal opinion you go wrong with get your such and such in 24 you know um, months where everything is like it's like microwave but did you really learn you know because in those types of courses you're doing all these discussion boards of like you said you're basically teaching yourself and yeah. I'm wondering, um, the purpose of you going there is to, is to develop a skill set and and to learn. And, and how much do you learn when you're going so fast and you never interact with anybody outside of a discussion board? And yes, you got your certificate or your degree or whatever you went there for. But did you really get the richness? Did you get what you paid for? You know, your return on your investment. Oh, um, exactly. Yes, I, I appreciate you um, pointing that out. Now, if, if synchronous or hybrid courses are, are offered, you said you like hybrid better. What's a good time frame for scheduling those courses uh, for traditional, non-traditional students? I feel that most of us in America work, uh, of course, during the day for the most part. So I feel like the time frame should be in the evening, maybe starting no earlier than five. I feel like most people are, you know, off work and home and have the kids settled by then five or six p.m. I feel like worked the best for me. Okay. And how long would you say that that time should be? 60 minutes, two hours? What What do you think? 
I feel no more than two hours um, because, of course, when you are in the working class that's doing the Monday through Friday, uh, early morning to the mid-afternoon shift, then, of course, you want to go to bed on time as well. And then if right. you are like I was in, especially that last year of college, taking multiple classes at one time and you have some that are like working at your own pace, but you still got that assignment due. You don't want to be um, on your courses that are synchronous too late, of course, knowing that you still have to turn in something for this other course or this one. And so, yeah, that makes sense. Now, let's talk about the uh, the onboarding process when you first you know, get into the program. Would you prefer a live synchronous orientation where you can ask questions with an individual or would you prefer a tutorial that you can complete at your own pace? Um, if I had to choose, I would rather do the live orientation. Okay. Um, I just feel like having somebody actually there live explaining it to you and not having to. Because when we go through things on our own, just like with the classes that I said, you're pretty much self-teaching. We don't do it the right way all the time. And I'm just being honest. We will skip through things. We try to take the easy way out, especially because if you're like me and you are busy anyway, you're like, let me just get this done. Let me just get it done. Let me get it over with. So you're just flying through it. You're not really fully getting the understanding that you would hearing it from someone on a live session. Mm. Well, you have made it to our last focus group question, Mrs. Glass. And so this is what I want to find out from you. This seems to be a major issue at some universities. What do you need from your advisor? Um, for my advisor, I need effective communication is the, the, the biggest thing. Um, I know that advisors are busy, colleges, universities, especially that was one of the big differences I seen from the community college. Universities are huge. They have lots of people to deal with on a daily and I get it. But um, you still care about your own education, of course. Um, so without that effective communication, I feel like it just it gets a lot of things off track from my own experience. Um onboarding and going in I uh I had a lot of times where I it, well I thought I was graduating in 2021 for example and then I didn't graduate until 2022 because it was like oh you didn't take this yet or this didn't transfer over and a lot of that was happening and I just feel like if the communication was better with my advisor then um that that could have went uh, a lot better which brings me to the second thing that I need which is organization um because again I feel as if they took the time to actually go through, uh, you know, the past classes that this student has taken, the the ones that will transfer and come up with an actual schedule, an actual plan, um, then then it would go a lot smoother for that student. You wouldn't have a student contacting you with emails or calls all the time saying like, what am I supposed to take now, especially at the end of the semester? I feel like they get overwhelmed with a lot more when everybody's about to sign up for classes for the upcoming semester. So did you have multiple advisors or the same one throughout your three years? I had the same one my whole, I think my last year she may have retired and I got a different one then. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you for participating in today's focus group. Your gift card is in your gift bag. <laughs> thank you. I'm saying that because I was in a beauty focus group before for Ulta. <laughs> I got a gift card. I was excited about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, Jessica, if you were to rate your experience with the online courses on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being outstanding and one being horrific, what rating would you give and why? Um, I would give an eight for convenience. So I have to do a different scale here. I don't okay. hear been eight for convenience um, just because, as stated before, with the whole working at your own pace, it was it was really, really convenient with working and uh, taking. I took five classes one semester at a time and three of them were synchronous during <laughs> the week and two oh, were not. Wow. So, yes, the convenience. But with the synchronous classes there, see, it wasn't as convenient all the time because sometimes I'd say like, oh, my daughter has gymnastics today. I got to hurry up and get her and get home and then get online for my class. And then sometimes we're on there until like nine or if we had a group project, the group wanted to meet after to uh, discuss something coming up with that. So the convenience though overall for the most part was pretty good. 
Um, but then on the flip side of that, with the classes that were asynchronous, I got to give it about a five because, as stated earlier, I don't feel like I learned as much in those courses. Like I got something from it, but I was self-teaching and honestly trying to just get it done. So I don't feel like I learned as much as I did in my synchronous courses. Okay, so you've given us our second dual score. Oh, <laughs> the last you think out of the box. I like that. Okay, so let's talk about your needs as an online student, Jessica. A need is defined as something you require because it is essential or very important. So when you click on that online course and, you, and you're ready to get started with that class and you're thinking about what's going to take place that semester, what do you need from your professor and from the course to be successful? I really need support. I need support. Even though we are distance, I feel like, you know, when you're face to face, you can walk up to that professor after class and just, you know, whisper something to them that you might not have wanted to ask in front of the whole class because you're embarrassed. You don't know it. Or you can literally talk to them during class. You're raising your hand. They see you. They're talking to you. And um, on a lot of the online classes, again, with those ones where they want you to just pretty much self-teach, um, I didn't feel too supported. Like um, when I didn't understand something, I didn't feel all the time that I could send them an email and reach out to them. I feel like more of a bother sometimes, to be honest, because, again, I know that they have tons of students, um, especially when you're doing online, because that gives professors, I feel, more opportunity to have more students since they don't have to actually have them come into the classroom on a certain day and a certain time. It's like they can have more because people are working at their own pace. So um, I feel like that's the main thing I need. I need support. I need to feel like I have a relationship with my professor, even when I'm not face to face with them and a relationship with my classmates as well, because that that was very important too. I felt like I did. You, you learn a lot more from the other people you interact with too who are doing the same thing as you your professor already knows or is supposed to already know the information they're teaching you they've got it but learning from someone else who's at the same level as you I, I feel like that that's a big help too yes I love that I always say it's um, good to learn with from and about each other because I even found when I taught um, elementary school, sometimes little children can explain something. They'll say, oh, what she was trying to say is. <laughs> and they can explain, you think you broke it down so well, so prolifically. And then a child will explain it to another child. And they'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> I see that all the time. And you're like, isn't that what I said? So they have their own little language because they're in the moment. you kind of outside of the learning experience to a degree. Because you already know it, like you say it. But then that person that's going through the the material and maybe actually still in the field doing that um, when you have non-traditional students, um, because, um, you know, they may already be teaching or be a TA or coming back to get a second degree or lots of things like that. They can give that more that more current, uh, you know, information or explain it in a way that you can relate to more so yeah. than answer sometimes. So all you needed, your only need was support. Um, and the same thing as I named with the advisor, communi effective communication and organization. Um, because with the support, again, a lot of times didn't feel like I had it because I didn't feel like there was communication there. Um, not open communication, not inviting communication all the time. Um, and then the organization, um, as I stated before, the whole working at your own pace, it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing too, especially because I know for me, I'm a proc procrastinator. Um, so if I didn't have those professors that were like, I'm not accepting it after 11.59 p.m. I mean, I loved having the ones that would give you a little extension or they'd understand when you have an emergency. But when there's literally like no organization, no structure there, and they're kind of just careless about it, um, I'm going to be careless about it too, honestly. And then I'm going to wait until the last, absolute last minute to get it done. So, hey, I don't have to... All right. So let's talk about your pet peeves then. It seems like you kind of address some of those, but let's just make sure. Now, a pet peeve is a minor annoyance that an individual finds particularly irritating. It's something that bothers you more than it bothers others. So your pet peeve may be different from somebody else's and that's OK. When you're taking online courses, Jessica, what are your pet peeves? My biggest pet peeve was feeling lost. Um. I just I don't like to feel like 
an airhead. <laughs> I don't like to feel like I don't know what's going on. And again, it happened more so with the this the asynchronous ones where I I remember going every semester and I'm like, I'm pumped. I'm like, I'm going to get it this time. I'm going to be on time with everything. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And I'm almost done. And then it would get here and I'd, I'd like start off great that first week. And after that, so a lot of times I just, I would feel completely lost. Um, especially if the teacher started, you know, posting things that we were expected to already know or expected to already know to do. And I literally just didn't know because when it was a work at my own pace, I'm putting it off, of course. And so right before that next class is most of the time when I was looking at it and it it made me feel lost. So the pet peeve kind of was brought on by my own personal choice, of course, because I'm the one decided to procrastinate. But um, I just hated like getting in the class or having something to do and feeling like, oh my goodness, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing for this. So what made you feel lost? Were there no, were there instructions not detailed or what, what was, what contributed to the feeling, the feeling of being lost? Yes. Again, with the asynchronous courses, a lot of times the instructions were not very clear. were not very detailed. I know sometimes even um, a lot of professors will use things from the previous semester or the previous year. And I do that as a teacher now too, um, saving stuff from the year before. But um, I mean, sometimes even down to that, you could tell if the professor didn't uh, didn't even look over or update something because of, you know, like the date not being changed or specific little things in there where you're like, what is this? Or how do I do this? And they, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't even change this from the last time I used it. Um, but asynchronous too you know you're expected to study on your own a lot and so again I know that was my own fault being a procrastinator not having someone on me to say like you got to do this today you got to get this done you got to talk and participate and tell me what you've learned what you've read from what you've learned from what you've just read when I didn't have that I I couldn't explain it because I'm doing it at the last minute too or right or doing what I can just to, to to show that that I did do something, you know, that I did get something out of it. But I, I was doing the bare minimum <laughs> to say the right. least. So you feel like it's more, is this what you're saying? It's more, it's diff- more difficult to stay motivated in an online asynchronous type of Yes, that was the exact words I'm looking for. The the motivation definitely was, it, it was hard to, to keep myself motivated. Because you have to make yourself quit, open that computer, open that laptop or go ahead and, and quit. When <laughs> you go face to face, you like, you know, you're going to see that person and see your, you know, your classmates. So exactly some people, right. Yeah. Some people think it's easier, but it does take a lot more discipline, I think, because, mm-hmm. yeah, you can just push it to the side. I'll, I'll go. I'll go on the computer later on. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you know, you've been on Netflix, Instagram and everything else, but you haven't opened up your computer to look at your course. So, yeah, I can relate to that. Yes, because you you reminded me of one little thing. I I, I started going to the gym too. That was another hobby of mine last year. <laughs> but good I know. Some of my I have a friend who's always saying, "Just work out at home. Just work out at home." When I'm like, I can't go to the gym. I'm too busy. And I said, "Well, when I work out at home, I'm not motivated at all because I'm right. in my house. I'm going to start doing other things. If I'm in the gym, I know I'm at the gym." what else am I going to do here? I have no choice but to work out. And it's the same thing with those classes. Tell me about it. When you work from home, that's a problem as well, because you can be washing clothes, but you need to be grading papers. Yes. I'm not telling on anybody. But (laughs) (laughs) So we made it to the end to our Dear Professor segment where you get the opportunity to share your heart with the fellow professor that you have in mind. Now, imagine that there's an online bulletin board with sticky notes or messages from students to professors. What is the note you would leave one of your college professors, Jessica? I would say, dear professor, you cared a lot about your students and it was obvious. You went above and beyond outside and using outside sources to try to help your students succeed the best way possible. Um, You were great at what you did you went above and beyond for your job I feel however sometimes I feel that you went out of your way um I feel that you weren't being supported as a professor when it came to some things 
Um, I've had different courses with you and I feel that with one specific course, um, you weren't knowledgeable on what you were teaching. And um, as you told me, you were kind of thrown into that teaching that course. Um, and I feel that you have to be supported to be able to support your students. I feel that you deserve to have the support in your career so that you can be successful the same way you wanted your students to become a success. Um, but I hope that you continue to be um, just like your students motivated. And um, I feel I hope that you continue to support your students when they are doing something new. Um, and I hope you continue to be you and be the best professor that you can be. Oh, Jessica, that was so sweet. I think it was great that you um, show compassion for this professor who was knowledgeable about what they were teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's really that's really kind of you, because I think sometimes students can be really hard on professors as well. And they're human. And so, oh, that was just so touching. Thank you. All right. So let me share my takeaways from today's conversation. So, Jessica, when you're taking a course online, you need support. You want to feel like you have a relationship with your professor and your classmates. And then you also need effective communication from your professor, from your advisor, as well as the, who's also a part of your program and your um, learning academic journey. And you need that organization um, and structure. So uh, that's basically the gist of what I got from what you share from your needs. Yes. Accurate? Yes. Well, good. Well, Jessica, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the Dear Professor series season two. I truly appreciate you spending time with me today. And I wish you well in all of your endeavors and those things you want to accomplish for 2024. May you accomplish them and so much more. Thank you so much. Same to you. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Remember to comment, like, share this series with three people this week. Follow on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe on YouTube. I look forward to spending time with you next week on the Dear Professor series, where college students who take courses online speak their minds. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.